In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about planning experiments and monitoring programs for environmental engineering projects. Our learning objectives for this lecture are to recognize different types of studies and monitoring programs, to develop QAQC guidelines for a monitoring program or study, and to develop protocols for sample collection and analysis. So the following questions are pertinent to any type of monitoring program or study. First thing we want to know is what, what is a sample? What do we mean by a sample? And where, when, and how should we collect samples? How many samples should we collect? And once we collect those samples, what measurements should we be taking in the field and in the laboratory? These questions are answered using QAQC plans and sampling plans. Um, before developing a QAQC and sampling plan, we need to first identify what type of program are we interested in planning. For example, here are a few different types of common monitoring programs. We would have compliance monitoring, which is when um, a, an engineered system is uh, trying, the purpose of the study is to demonstrate compliance with a certain limit or uh, regulation that might be in effect. Maybe it's related to water quality, maybe air quality. Um, we also might have a program that is designated more as like a research project or a special study where your objective there is to answer some type of research question to, to discover information about something that's currently unknown. Uh, and then another type of monitoring program could be an emergency study. Maybe there was um, you know chemical spill and now we need to mobilize quickly and uh, study the extent of the situation. So no matter what type of study it is uh, that you're engaged in, quality assurance and quality control are essential components uh, for monitoring programs or, or research projects. Um, so QA, QC are related, but they're different from each other. QA, quality assurance, is something where you are, measure, you are implementing measures to prevent errors from happening. It's a comprehensive program that involves monitoring all aspects of the laboratory. Quality control, on the other hand, are measures that are, in, measures that are implemented to detect errors or to detect mistakes. It ensures that the data are both accurate and precise. QA and QC go hand in hand. Um, so QC is considered to be part of QA. So an overall QA would include quality control, but it would also include a number of other quality assurance measures. So is it possible to do quality control without doing quality assurance? Yes, not recommended, but it is possible. Is it possible to do quality assurance without doing quality control? The answer there would be no, because quality control is, in, is a part of a quality quality assurance plan. So what are some quality control measures? Um, some examples are calibrating our instruments using standards, like solutions that have a known concentration of a constituent. Uh, also the analysis of standards, blanks, sample replicates, spikes, reference samples. And we can have different types of blanks, different types of replicates. So for example, you might have a field blank, a laboratory blank, or an instrument blank. Um, replicates can be field replicates, they can be laboratory replicates. We also include within quality control measures the determination of limits of detection and quantification. So I'm going to go through now six essential concepts that are affiliated with a QAQC plan or a quality assurance project plan. So the first is the scope of the study. Then we're going to talk about the samples and populations. Number three, we're going to talk about what kind of measurements are done and what, what is the anticipated use of the data. For four, we're looking at standard assessment thresholds and operating procedures. Then we'll talk in more detail about QC samples. And finally, data, and data management and analysis. So the first one, scope of study. We want to determine first and foremost, what questions are we hoping to answer with the study? Are there boundaries or limits in terms of location? Are there boundaries and limits in terms of the length and the time frame of the study? All those aspects of a study are important in order to determine the scope. And we want to make sure that our 
study is feasible, meaning that we have a sufficient number of samples, we're using standard methods, but still we're being cost effective. So enough samples, but not too many so that you're still cost effective. We wanna make sure that it's interesting. Our, is our study going to be read, referenced, or used by others? So do something that is um, of interest to, to the stakeholder community. Number three, relevant. We wanna make sure our studies are relevant, that they have direct and practical applications to practice or policy. We also wanna make sure that our studies are ethical, that we're protecting the rights, the welfare, and the well-being of any participants or any community members who might be impacted by the study. Here are three examples of different types of studies and the questions that they are proposing to answer. So the first study, a non-point source contamination study, let's suppose during a rain event, we have um, concentrations of suspended solids in the new river, and we want to understand how those concentrations change with respect to time. And we might be looking at locations upstream and downstream of a construction site. So our question that we're trying to answer, you can see it's very specifically defined in terms of its scope. Uh, we're looking at during a rain event, we're looking at upstream and downstream of a particular construction site and our focus is on suspended solids. The second study, evaluation of treatment plant performance. So this is a very common study where we have a treatment plant and our goal is to understand how that treatment plant is performing. So in this example, uh, we have a pilot scale UASB reactor treating wastewater from a small city. And we wanna know how does the reduction of COD vary throughout the year and with respect to temperatures and influent loading rates. All right, so again, very well-defined study. We have our factors, our variables that, that we want to assess. Uh, the third type of study, a drinking water source compliance program. So let's say we have a reservoir and this reservoir is a proposed source of raw water for a new drinking water treatment plant. And we're looking to find out if the concentrations of contaminants, constituents, um, and other compounds are above or below the maximum contaminant levels. And so there you go, uh, a, another type of study, but with a very well-defined scope. So location, of course, part of the scope is the physical location, and we've got very well-defined physical locations for these three studies, and also the length and the time frame. So we're, we would want to specify in the QAQC plan when the project is proposing to start and when it's anticipated to end. Number two, samples, samples, and populations. So I say samples twice because when we talk about environmental engineering, we really have two different types of samples. And it's easy sometimes for people to get confused between these two different types of samples. So the first type, perhaps the one that we're most familiar with, is the environmental sample, right? This is the, the sample of water that's collected from a river or from a lake or from a stream. And we, we would call that our sample. However, we also have a different type of sample that we need to be concerned with, and that's our statistical sample. So if you recall from your statistics class, a statistical sample is when you have a population, the easiest analogy is say you have a population of people in a particular area, and you want to take a random sample of those people and ask some survey questions, for example. So the people who get surveyed, those would be your sample. And using that sample, we're going to make inference about the population. So based on the answers of those individuals, we're going to make some inference about what the entire population might feel or, or how they might respond. So we need to distinguish now, we have a, an environmental sample but in environmental engineering, environmental studies, we also have a statistical sample and we have a statistical population. So what does that mean? What does that look like in terms of a monitoring program or a study? So let's take an example. Let's say we've, we've got a lake. Um, here's Lake Brienz in Switzerland. And let's say that this is our lake of interest and we really want to determine um, how much nitrate is in this lake. And so our population 
would be the population of all the nitrate contained within this lake. Our environmental sample would be a water sample that we collect from the lake. However, our statistical sample would be a collection of multiple water samples that are collected from the lake uh, throughout the course of some period of time, or perhaps uh, at different locations spatially distributed throughout the lake. All right, so in this statistical sample, let's say we collect 15 environmental samples. So our sample size here would be n equals 15. But now we also have another sample size here, which is the volume of water that's being collected. So again, when you think about sampling in environmental engineering, you have to always keep in mind that we have two different types of samples, and those samples have sizes that need to be determined in order to adequately answer our question. So point number three is about measurements and anticipated use of the data. Whenever planning, uh, whenever you're planning a, a program for monitoring, you want to always know ahead of time what types of measurements and observations you're planning to make. And this could change throughout the course of the study, especially based on your preliminary findings. You might reanalyze your plan of what measurements or observations are needed. However, at the beginning, you should have you should have an idea of what you're planning to do. And so the types of measurements we're talking about here, they could be field measurements, maybe we're talking about bioassessments, continuous data, um, things that would be uh, monitored remotely, for example. Chemistry, this might include samples that are collected, taken back to a laboratory for analysis. We also might have um, measurements of, of soils or solids, and um, the samples also could vary we, we want to also be able to specify what matrix we're sampling, observing. For example, is it water? Is it drinking water, environmental water, polluted water? Are we talking about sludge or biosolids? Or maybe it's soil is the matrix, or is, is it animal tissue like a bioassessment? Um, and we want to know how is that data going to be going to be used? So once we gather the data, what is the, what's the action that comes after that? What are we going to do with that data? Why are we collecting the data? So again, this comes back to what type of study is, is, is it? If it's a compliance study, then the use of the data would be to assess the current situation with respect to the regulations uh, so that we can determine if the system is complying with those regulations. Um, if it's an emergency assessment, the data might be used to make decisions about investing in some kind of solution. Uh, if it's a research project, then the data might be more for advancing scientific knowledge or advancing practical knowledge about a particular problem. And we wanna always think about, you know, what decisions will be made from the data, what possible actions might be taken to, depending on the results obtained. Standard thresholds and operating procedures. So this is related to the case where we might have a compliance type of study. So an assessment threshold might include something like a total maximum daily load, which is the maximum amount of a pollutant that's allowed to enter a water body in order to meet water quality standards. And uh, we might be assessing our data with respect to, to this type of threshold. Another threshold we might be looking at in a study would be maximum contaminant level, which is the maximum permissible level of a contaminant in water source delivered through a public water system. Public health goal is another type of threshold. We also have ambient air quality standards. So, um, you know, depending on the study, depending on the purpose, we might have different types of assessment thresholds that we are comparing our data to. Quality control samples. So quality control includes an initial demonstration of capability and then also ongoing demonstration of capability and determining the method detection limit. So the initial demonstration is usually performed using calibration standards. This is to ensure the accuracy of measurement. Um, also by analyzing process blanks, which are also called reagent blanks or method blanks. This is a negative control. The purpose here is to demonstrate the lack of contamination during the sample analysis. And we would also analyze some kind of positive control, like a spiked control, which is where we add a known concentration of the target constituent, and we are analyzing the sample 
after that in order to determine accuracy and precision of the measurement. After the initial demonstration, we would start the study, start collecting our samples and, and uh, performing the analyses. Uh, and during that time, we would continue to be engaged in quality control through ongoing demonstration of capability. And so that would include periodic field blanks, periodic process blanks, periodic instrument blanks, and in some cases, background control samples, just to demonstrate the quality control throughout the course of the study. And we need to have some kind of rules when interpreting quality control samples, and that should be described in the quality assurance plan. So for example, let's look at three different types of blanks. We've got the field blank, which is when you take a, a sample, let's say it's, if you're doing a water quality analysis for a river, your field blank might be DI water that's taken out to the field with you. So you would fill it up in the lab with DI water, take it out to the field with you, and keep it alongside all the rest of your sample bottles, and then analyze that when you analyze the rest of your samples. And the, the purpose of that kind of blank is to ensure that you're not contaminating the sample bottles out in the field. Uh, a process blank would be a sample blank that you don't take out to the field with you, but you process it just like you would any other sample. So it's, it might be, again, like DI water, for example, and it's getting processed the same way as you process all the rest of your samples. Maybe you're filtering it, maybe you're concentrating it, maybe you're performing some kind of extraction. An instrument blank, on the other hand, would be where you don't perform all of the different steps involved in the sample processing, but you are putting the blank into the instrument to demonstrate that the instrument is distinguishing a blank sample from a sample that has um, positive detection of the constituent. So uh, all of these blanks should come out negative if you're not having any issues in the laboratory and you're not contaminating any of the samples within the laboratory or the field. Uh, so if we get the first type of outcome where we have negative for all three of these samples, the interpretation there would be that no contamination has occurred. If we get the second outcome, which is where the field blank is negative, the process blank is negative, the instrument blank is positive, we can concur from that that the contamination likely occurred at the instrument or maybe the instrument needs to be recalibrated. If we get negative for the field blank, a positive for the process blank, and a positive for the instrument blank, then we can conclude that the contamination likely occurred during sample processing and may also have occurred at the instrument. Finally, if we get positive result for the field blank, positive for the process blank, and positive for the instrument blank, um, we really don't know where the contamination may have occurred, but it probably occurred out in the field. All right, some other controls, such as controls for inhibition that might be run is um, we might need to test to ensure that the reaction was not inhibited by some other constituents in the sample. So for example, if we dilute the sample, let's say on a ratio of one to 10, the sample concentration in the diluted control should be equal to 10% of the undiluted sample, right? Because we're diluting it with water at a, at a rate of one to 10. Um, and so if that's the case, then there would be no evidence of inhibition. But if the sample concentration in the dilution control is much greater than 10% of an undiluted sample, then that would be an indication that inhibition has occurred. Um, because as we dilute the sample, we're diluting the constituent of interest, but we also might be diluting some inhibitors that are pre preventing the test from detecting that constituent. All right, another way to test for inhibition is using a spiked sample. So um, in a spiked sample, we are um, adding three times the sample concentration, for example, into uh, a replicate, and we're analyzing it alongside the other, the other sample replicates. And um, if we get, if we're spiking the sample at a concentration three times the sample concentration, um, 
and we detect back what we know that we added in, then that would be no evidence of inhibition. But if we detect back something that's much less than um, what we added, much different from what we added, we might concur that inhibition has occurred. In terms of data management and analysis, we need to determine what's the purpose of collecting the data, what's the purpose for analysis, how many samples will we have, um, what type of data will be collected, and what type of statistical method or what type of hypothesis test will we be using to analyze the data. So here are some examples. Um, if our purpose is to be descriptive, where we just want to describe the central tendency and variation, so maybe we just want to know what is the average concentration of some constituent in a, in a field of soil or in a lake, for example. Uh, we could do this with one sample. We could also do it with more than one sample, and we could do it for each of the different sample locations. Um, statistical tests we would use here would be descriptive statistics, like confidence intervals, um, proportions. They might be, they could be different types of uh, data like continuous numbers or percentages um, or even count data. Inferential comparative analysis would be where we are comparing one sample against a threshold. And when I say sample here, what I mean is a statistical sample, right? So we might be comparing a statistical sample comprised of many environmental samples. We might be comparing the concentration of some constituent to a threshold, like a regulatory limit or a target value. And so for that type of analysis, we would want to use a one sample t-test, for example, a, a statistical inferential test. For um, the next row here, we have inferential comparative. So this is where we would analyze two samples, so two different locations, perhaps. And in this type of analysis, we're comparing the two concentrations to determine if they're significantly different from each other. So we would use here, we would use a two sample t-test. And there's different variations of the t-test, like you could have a one-sided or two-sided t-test, you could have independent or paired samples, and some different types of assumptions that can be made about the variance. We can also use non-parametric methods, which uh, we will explain a little bit later on in this semester, but an example of that would be the rank test or the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Um, the third type of analysis or purpose of analysis to cover here would be inferential comparative for two samples. So this is where instead of comparing uh, continuous data like concentrations, we might be comparing proportions or percentages. Um, so we can use different type of statistical tests here, like the chi-square test or the Fisher's exact test. The purpose of this table is not for you to memorize all of these different types of statistical tests. It's really just to emphasize the fact that we need to start out with what is our purpose of this monitoring program. And then we need to think about, okay, once we get the data, what are we gonna do with it? What type of statistical test or what type of statistical analysis are we going to perform? So some questions to think about, what is an example of a continuous variable? What does that mean, right? Compared to a proportion or percentage variable, this would be some review from what you might've seen in a, in a previous statistics class. Um, and what are examples of these other types of data? So Poisson count and proportion or percentage. All right, so all of this information, those six steps to planning a quality assurance and quality control plan. This would all get written up into a report that's called the Quality Assurance Project Plan, abbreviated as the QAP. So a QAP involves laying out things associated with quality assurance like staff organization responsibilities. So if you're working for a company, you would describe the organization of that company, what are the responsibilities of the different people in the company with respect to the monitoring program. Um, you would also describe uh, the procedures used to make sure that the personnel are trained. You would describe the plan for sample collection, how to store samples, how to document them. 
uh, what types of standard operating procedures are going to be used, um, what's going to happen with quality control samples so that which ones are going to be run and how are you going to interpret and monitor the results. You would describe uh, how data are going to be reviewed and how reports are going to be written and how records would be kept for things like equipment and instruments to make sure that they get calibrated, that they're maintained, et cetera. So this would all go into the QAP. The California State Water Resources Control Board has a program for surface water quality monitoring called the SWAMP program. And the QAP required for all SWAMP projects involve a six-step process. Uh, so based on what we discussed previously. So step one, what are you going to study? Step two, how are you going to use the results? Step three, what kind of data did, will you collect? Four, what are the boundaries? What is the scope of the study? Step five, how much error is acceptable? So that's related to your QC samples. How much uh, error are you willing to accept in those QC samples? And then step six, how will the data be analyzed? All right, so before you even start sampling, you should be thinking about, like I mentioned, what type of statistical method will be used in order to analyze the data and adequately answer the question for your study. Usually, like I mentioned, we're trying to do one of these three things. We're trying to describe our sample, or in more, maybe in that case, we're not trying to compare it to anything else. We're just trying to describe what is the level of constituent in the sample. Um, two, we might be comparing our sample to something fixed, like a threshold or a regulatory limit. Um, we might be comparing it to some other sample, like a two-sample t-test or two-sample comparison. Which one of these two samples is, is, has a greater concentration than the other one? Or three, we might be trying to infer some trends that would influence our sample. So that would be a case of using methods like regression or correlation. So like how much does this factor influence the results of our analysis, of, you know, the results of our sample. So here are some examples, like I mentioned, the types of statistical methods, descriptive statistics, hypo hypothesis testing, like a t-test or analysis of variance, ANOVA, or in the third case, correlation or regression analysis. And this, you probably already know this based on if you've used Excel, it's the add trend line feature to a data set. So that's what, it, that's what I'm referring to here. All right, so we're gonna do an example problem next time we meet in class. The objective of this example problem will be to design a soil sampling plan for your soils lab. And so in this lab, you're gonna be measuring soil moisture and organic matter content. Use and you're going to design your sampling approach using one of the following methods. There's um, the judgmental method, the random method, the stratified random method, systematic grid sampling, systematic random sampling, search sampling, and transect sampling. And each of these have their own purpose. So uh, let's say you're doing an environmental site assessment and you're trying to establish a threat from some contamination, or maybe you're trying to identify the source of a contamination, or even delineate the extent of a known uh, contamination. Uh, so depending on what your objective is, again, you might have a different approach that would be the most appropriate. So judgment sampling is based on the subjective selection of sample locations based on historical information or maybe from previous site investigations. There's no randomization associated with where you're collecting samples because you're going right to the spots that you know or that you have a high suspicion or you feel like there's a high probability that there's going to be contamination. So in this type of sampling approach, you wouldn't use statistical calculations, for example, like descriptive statistics based on the sampling results because they would be unfairly biased to the locations that you you selected based on some previous information. So you wouldn't be able to use this data to char characterize an entire field, let's say, for example, but you would be able to use it to maybe determine what are the maximum concentrations that are found within the areas that you suspected were contaminated. 
Random sampling involves the arbitrary selection of sites within a defined area. So you can see here, if our defined site is outlined here uh, in black, you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, eight sampling locations, and they're randomly selected at different coordinates within this sampling area. Uh, to facilitate the statistical probabilities, of contaminant concentration, you would have to operate under the assumption that the area of concern is more or less homogeneous with respect to whatever parameters you're monitoring. But this would give you a random sample of that area and allow you to make some inferences about the concentration of a constituent within the entire area. Stratified random sampling involves the random selection of sample locations based on their location within the area, uh, just like in the previous approach, but the stratified part of it is that you would be collecting the samples at two different depths, for example. So here you can see three bore samples, um, and you've got a sample collected from one and a half feet to three feet. You've got another strata collected from six feet to seven and a half feet depth. And you're doing that each of the sample locations the same way. Systematic grid sampling involves dividing up the area of concern into smaller sampling areas using a squares or triangles to make a grid. And then you would collect the samples from each of the intersections uh, or each of the nodes within that grid. So the distance between these nodes, the way you would set this up in the field, depends on how many samples do you need to collect in order to um, adequately answer your question. Once you determine that, then you can determine the size of your grid. You go out into the field, um, install some stakes, and then collect the samples at each of the nodes within that grid system. Systematic random sampling is kind of a combination between random, completely random sampling and grid sampling. So you can see here, you still set up the grid, but instead of sampling at each node in the grid, you might sample at a random location within each box. And so this, um, can have some advantages over the, the systematic sampling approach if um, you want to avoid features that might be evenly spaced out. So to get a little bit more of a representative sample, you might choose the systematic random sampling approach. Search sampling is um, where you, you utilize a systematic grid or random sampling approach, but you're using it to define areas where contaminants exceed cleanup standards. So you're, you're trying to find these hot spots. And um, the distance between the grid lines would be dependent on the, the acceptable level of error that you have. So you know how, how much are you willing to potentially miss a hot spot because your grid size is too large? Um, this sampling approach requires that you make some assumptions about the size, the shape, and maybe even the depth of the hot spots. Transect sampling is where you establish one or more lines. They might be parallel or non-parallel, and you're establishing these lines across the area of concern, and, um, and then choosing sample locations along those transects. So if the lines are parallel, this approach is very similar to systematic grid sampling. Um, the advantage here is that it's a relatively easy method, method to establish and relocate transect lines uh, instead of moving around an entire grid. And um, again, the distance between these sample locations is determined by how long the line is and how many samples you need to collect. So this is the activity we're going to do in class. You're, for your lab, you're going to be determining uh, the soil moisture and organic matter within this stretch of the Alvarado Creek. So this is Route 8 right here looking west and you could see here SDSU campus there's the engineering building over here and you've got um, geology mathematics building around here and um, of course the the trolley line that runs over this parking area so you can see the riverbed for Alvarado Creek which extends within this area that is your area of interest so it's starting at this culvert over here and ending with a culvert that goes underneath College Ave. 
So within that area, your team is going to come up with a sampling plan using one of the methods described in the previous slides and come up with a plan for how you're going to collect your samples in the next lab. All right. 